My talk is, there's plenty of room in the middle. Uh, you'll, you'll hopefully come across what that is. It's, uh, of course, a play on Feynman. Um, a quick disclaimer, everything I'm going to show you today is, is in like my personal capacity and, and publicly available. Um, unfortunately, I can't tell about our startup, which is doing kind of a very specific thing, one of those things that we get funding for. Um, but what I'm going to talk about today is, I think, a, a broader use case of it and something that I think is like quite interesting. So what I want to talk about is one vision for atomically precise devices, uh, in way, one way that you can conceive of it. And my, my claim is, is that scalable top-down fabrication and bottom-up protein design synthesis are able to meet in the middle. Now this is like somewhat obviously true, like everyone here knows that like we can actually go beyond that down to like single atoms and we, we saw some really interesting stuff with DNA uh, nanotechnology going much broader than this. And so m my claim is actually a, a little narrower and, and it's actually behind, the, the excitement here is really behind like one big discovery that I think should be like more widely known and I wanna kind of focus on with this talk, which is that New discoveries, particularly with uh, engineered proteins being conductive, and a way to interface them with electronics makes this like particularly exciting. Um, and de novo protein design and potentially creative ideas that could come from workshops here, I think, could make this even more exciting. And again, I, I'm talking about like uh, one instance of this, and it's not to say anything about any of the other uh, approaches. So top down, I think like everyone already knows this, especially here, but. We're talking about scalable fabrication. Uh, it can easily be done down to the five nanometer range. Nothing like too special there, but my, my big point is that we can do lots of fabrication. Here's like two review papers that uh, go into details here, down to the scale of proteins where we can do fully de novo engineering up. Uh, again, and when you go to semiconductor fabrication, you know, this is IBM's two nanometer chip architecture. Obviously the dimensions are like slightly different there and, and this is doing something uh, somewhat different. But my big claim is, is that for the scale that we can do, you know, know where each atom is with proteins, we can do that top down fabrication and we can do that bottom up de novo design. Uh, I won't say too much about the bottom up. I think people here can tell me much more about this and that's what I'm excited. Um, but I did do my PhD on nanopores and these are engineered all the time. These are some engineered nanopores uh, from Oxford Nanopore that they use for DNA sequencing. Um, and I would actually claim that this isn't even like a new idea. We've been doing some of this merging of bottom up and top down meeting in the middle as I'm calling it already. Um, but it hasn't been like exceptionally exciting. I mean, this is merging atomically precise biological nanopores with solid state sensors uh, where the part that matters at least, you know where every single atom is and then they can be placed around and you can indeed do like DNA sequencing with this. And this is pretty exciting. Um, and this is a kind of a neat paper showing that. But the question is like, can we do more though? Um, and like, can we interface this with electronics? And from where I've already told you where the talk going, the answer is yes. Um, but this was a long winding road to get here. Uh, molecular electronics is, a, you know, a, a very old field now. Um, and there's been a lot of exciting work done there. Uh, but you can't go very far with this. I mean, um, you, you can build these longer molecules, but the, the conformation of them changes the conductance. Um, and so people started to think, well, could we, could we get more complicated synthesis, and of course they look to, to life. And people tried some measurements with peptides. Um, th this is back in 2004, and they, they sucked. Uh, they, they, were, they weren't better than a lot of the molecular wires um, we could do. So what's changed and what am I telling you about today? Well, to, to cut to it and, and not spend too much time on the discovery, although I'd be kind of happy to tell the story, my colleagues at Arizona State University started messing around with some STM measurements. I think a lot of people here are familiar with this. This kind of came out of the field of STM break junctions, kind of playing around, could you uh, detect you know, specific binding and kind of see what's going on? And what they started to see for several years was that these things looked like they were conducting pretty close to omically. Uh, here you can see the IV trace on the side of conduction through a antibody. And I think this was kind of chalked up to like interesting, but probably something's going wrong. Um, but a few more proteins were tried and 
you have to do some special things to make this work. If you just put proteins on metal, they'll, they'll denature, uh, and you won't make any contacts with them. They'll lose their conformation. But if you do some clever things like functionalize uh, gold with um, biotin and then put down streptavidin, you can complete circuits. And when you start doing some of these measurements, some interesting things start to happen. You start to discover that proteins are actually pretty conductive uh, on the order of like nano semen conductance, uh, which is rivaling molecular wires at short uh, lengths. But when you get out to some of the longer lengths that you can do with proteins, and we've done measurements out to around 20 nanometers to dispel kind of any question of whether this is tunneling or not, uh, you can continue to see pretty high conductance. So, you know, contrary to beliefs, proteins, and this is the big caveat, with engineered attachments to inject charges into the hydrophobic core can have anomalously large long-range conductance. We're still studying it. Uh, it looks like it's a, a hopping mechanism that allows you to do like resonant hopping through these uh, molecules to different residues, uh, particularly aromatic ones. And we're doing some experiments right now to kind of show if you uh, vary some of the uh, content of different amino acids, you can change the conductance of these proteins. Um, and so this is pretty exciting. But, and, you know, here are some other measurements done by uh, my colleague Stuart Lindsay, kind of showing that you can do this with lots of different proteins, uh, kind of, you know, trying to show that it, it's, it's not like a one-off. Um, so far, most things we've measured, you can do conductance with. Um, but again, this is about molecular machines. I've just showed you wires. Um, and so uh, I won't go into all the work about how we did this, but what you can do is if you start to get a little clever, you can use some of these proteins as wires and you can put machines in them. And of course, what are machines? We heard it earlier. These are enzymes. Um, and this is an example of, and this is in a, a scanning tunneling microscope, contacts made between streptavidin a 529 polymerase, and then streptavidin. And these traces that you see on the screen here are feeding it different templates, and we're seeing characteristic signals coming out of each of them. And so this is interesting. Now we can like monitor molecular machines, atomically precise machines, machines where we can specify where we want each atom via each amino acid. Um, and we can start to take measurements. Um, and some of our, our colleagues at Imperial College have shown similar types of measurements of proteins, so you don't have to take our word for it. They do it in a very interesting way as well. They make these uh, glass capillaries that they make little tunnel junctions in and then insert proteins. These are interesting because these can be scanned around very similarly to uh, scanning probe techniques. You can place these capillaries with nanometer precision. Uh, so we heard some stuff about some kind of pick and place type stuff earlier. Now imagine a little molecular machine on the end of an atomically, uh, no, a nanometer scale precision probe that you can start to place around. Things start to get a little interesting. Um, and just to kind of show that there's, there's, this is adjacent to another field, you know, there's been a lot of work done with these field effect transistor type work. This is um, from the Collins lab at UC Irvine, where they've shown monitoring of uh, a lysozyme and a polymerase attached to a carbon nanotube. Um, and then there's another company, uh, Roswell Biotechnologies, that has already kind of pushed out ahead and made scalable electronics up to 16,000, you know, uh, individually addressable electrodes in which they've been using protein wires to attach as well. Now again, they're using a field effect type mechanism as opposed to direct electrical conductance through the proteins. Um, but hopefully the picture I'm painting is that uh, if you can do this in an STM and kind of see the movement of molecular machines, you could place them into these electronics and go from there. So, so the vision is that you, you, you can merge these things together which are already scalable. And so it, it's not saying you can't do the other things as well, but I think it's an exciting one. Um, I'll just say maybe these are possibilities for interfaces between computers and molecular machines. Maybe this is a way to bootstrap molecular machines. I don't know. I think what we do know is that anything a protein can bind to, take as a substrate or react with is a potential sensing target. And I'll skip the bottlenecks, but I'll, I'll go to the challenge. Uh, what I've told you is sensing what proteins do. The question I have for protein designers is like, can this go in reverse? Like, can proteins be designed or electrically modulated uh, so that you could wire them up 
and have them do something in reaction. I don't know the answer to that. Maybe the answer is no, uh, but that's something I was excited to explore this weekend. And I'll just say, in another life, I did beam-driven stuff, so if anyone's interested in this type of fully top-down stuff, I'd be excited to chat about it. We're doing some experiments to probe this. Um, it, it seems to be the case because if, if you uh, vary residues on the interior of the protein, you'll see differences in conductance. Um, but yeah, I, I wouldn't say we have the mechanism fully worked out. Uh, and so, uh, but it, it seems to be the case. And this seems to be why peptides you know, don't show conductance, why if you just try to put you know, pili on electrodes, you also don't see, you need to get them into the hydrophobic interior uh, away from basically all the water to allow them to hop through undisturbed. We don't necessarily see that. I mean, we're usually using pretty low biases, around 50 millivolts for them. Um, it, definitely the, the uh, work function of the metal that you're using to inject charges into the protein matters quite a bit in terms of modulating the conductance. I do suspect that you could go to higher biases or even use like a liquid gate from the solution to modulate the conformation or do something like that. That's some of the exciting stuff that I think you could potentially do with these. Different fragments will have different zeta potentials uh, in the protein structure. Some would be negatively charged, some would be positively charged, and I can't imagine that they won't reorient and reshape themselves when you inject the charge. They might. I mean, we, we, we can, so far though, it seems like we can, we can uh, put, you know, 50 millivolts on a polymerase and it's happy to take its uh, template and process without anything being there. So yeah, possibly, but we're, we're still trying to understand a lot of the mechanics of it. Yeah. 